Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to DjangoCon Australia 2015. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Russell Keith McGee. I am the president of the Django Software Foundation and a 10-year veteran of the Django core team. Um, and I've been sort of running, helping to organise the Django Con Australia um, for the last three years. Uh, before we get going, a few thank yous. Um, this, this event wouldn't happen at all, uh, except for if it wasn't for the organisers of PyCon AU, uh, especially the, this year's principal, Clinton Roy, and his team of hard-working little elves. Um, it also wouldn't happen, it wouldn't happen at all if it wasn't for Chris Neugebauer, who's currently standing at the back of the room there. So everyone, throw fruit. Um, Chris was the person who came up with, well, came up with the idea of doing a mini comp structure inside PyCon itself, which is, uh, it, it means that the, as organisers of DjangoCon and for the other mini comps as well, we've been able to piggyback all the hard parts about organising a conference, like getting a venue that you know, that, that's going to fit enough people and all that sort of thing. We can defer that off to someone else and they can worry about it and we just worry about the fun part about who's going to talk. Uh, so the success of the event today is as much due to the PyCon team and, and you know, the innovations of people like Chris as it is to anyone else. So thank you very much to PyCon, the PyCon team and everyone else involved there. The principal sponsor of today's event is the Django Software Foundation. Uh, Django Software Foundation is the not-for-profit organisation registered in the US that maintains the uh, copyright and does the legal and fundraising around the Django project. Uh, we raise funds specifically to do things like fund Django Girls events, of which there have been many, many over the last 12 months, and also uh, uh, the Django Fellowship. So Tim, uh, Tim Graham, who has been doing some magnificent work over the last uh, eight to nine months, uh, making sure that the patches on the, t on the, on the Django ticket tracker are, are being applied in a um, timely fashion. So uh, if you would like that work to continue, and I very much hope that everyone here would like that work to continue, please come and speak to me because we are in a constant need of more money and I'm led to believe that some of you may have some and I'm willing to shake you down for it. Um, so yes, if you do, if, you, if your, your company uses Django, please consider supporting the DSF financially because we very much need your help. Uh, in the keeping of the spirit of reconciliation, I'd also like to acknowledge the Turbal, Yogera, Kabi Kabi and Jin, uh, Jinibara peoples as traditional owners of the lands where we now stand and recognise that these have always been places of teaching and learning. Uh, that's not the... Okay. Uh, unlike all events that have been sponsored by the Django Software Foundation and PyCon, this event has a code of conduct. Uh, the specific text is on the PyCon Australia website if you're interested under the reg register tab. If you've got any questions about the code of conduct or, heaven forbid, you need to report a problem, please find myself or one of the uh, PyCon organisers. Uh, we'll take whatever action is necessary. We do take these, these code of conduct very seriously. We want this to be an inclusive and friendly event for all participants uh, and we will not tolerate uh, inappropriate behaviour. So please, if you do have a problem, don't hesitate to come and find us out because we, uh, we, will, we will act on those, those complaints. Uh, housekeeping. Toilets are out and to the right. Um, morning and afternoon tea is apparently going to be provided. I don't believe lunch is provided, but we can, I haven't actually confirmed that one, so I should check that one out. There are not, unfortunately, any lightning talks today, unless uh, one of the speakers hasn't turned up, in which case we might have to fill a slot with some lightning talks. Um, so, but there will be lightning talks during the main Python conference uh, on Saturday and Sunday, so if you do have a little something something you want to talk about, uh, there may be five minute slots available for you to do that. But, Okay, so who has, on, on the show, who has been to all three Django Con, all three Australian Django Cons? There we go, we've got some hardcore, hardcore drivers here. Okay, all right. Um, who is a first timer? This is their first Django Con. Hey, all right. So, for those of you who are first timers, you may not be aware that we have uh, a little bit of a tradition with Django Con. The tradition goes back to the very, very first Django Con US uh, back in 2008. Uh, a man named Cal Henderson, who was one of the founders of Flickr, uh, was their first keynote speaker at that event. And uh, he gave a talk entitled, Why I Hate Django. Uh, the talk, the, the video of that talk is actually still up on YouTube and it is well worth watching. You know, it's eight years later, but it's well worth watching. It's a fantastically presented talk, highly amusing, and actually it shows you the origin of the Django pony. It comes from that talk, essentially. Um, but since then, we've made a habit of regularly inviting members of other language communities, uh, other web frameworks to come to DjangoCon and tell us what we're doing wrong or what we don't know that we should know or why some people don't, can't or won't use Django. Uh, in that spirit, it is my great pleasure to invite to the stage Amber Brown. Uh, she is a 
organizer in the Django community. She is uh, organizer of Django Girls in Perth. She's also organizing the Django event on Monday. Monday, Monday yes. yes. Uh, and, but uh, in, when, when she's not uh, collaborating with us Django people, she's also the uh, uh, release manager for Twisted. And in that vein, given that Twisted has some opinions about things, um, she is here to tell us what, uh, what uh, Django is doing wrong when it comes to real time in particular. Everything. So everyone, please welcome to the stage, Emma Brown. <laughs> everyone hang on hello yeah there we go can everyone hear me great um, I am going to type my password wrong several times there we go and plug this in so yes um, da, da, da. Uh, what what do you have to be on 1080p is that fine Yay. Uh, I can't read those ones. <laughs> okay. Sorry for the TV. So, um, this is what Django can learn from Twisted. Um, well, hello, I am Amber Brown, better known as Hawkeye or Hawkey Owl on Twitter, if you want to follow my inane ramblings. I hail from Perth, uh, where Russ lives as well. We are like the only two Django people there. It's, well, not quite. The, the only ones that came to the meetup, anyway. Um, so, <laughs> yay. Um, I also organize uh, Django Girls events, which is pretty fun. And uh, I serve on the Django Code of Conduct Committee. So, otherwise, I don't really have much to do with Django. I don't use it, I don't like using it. It's, well, some, some bits are pretty good, which I'll get into later. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't use it um, any major part of the time. I am a Twisted Core developer, though, and a release manager. 15.3 um, is in pre-release, and 15.4 is coming out in like two months. It boasts more Python 3 support, more removing old stuff that no one likes, um, and other things like that, so sh shedding some historical stuff and you know twisted is it's pretty cool I, I, I think <laughs> but uh, everyone remembers last year's Django con <laughs> keynote and since I kept inanely rambling about twisted and why it's great and Django why it sucks and everything Russell was like well get up on the stage and tell me about it so sort of making me put my money where my mouth is so but I think that talks are only rarely worthwhile if they educate or entertain. So I don't want to do like last year. So I'm going to say upfront, no ambiguity, Django does not suck. It is pretty great. Uh, we might say, uh, some people might say that, but it's mainly in jest. Django is great. There's a friend friendly rivalry, if it, even if it doesn't seem like it comes off like that. The talk's conclusion is not that using Twisted or Haskell or Clojure or Ruby or anything makes you a better programmer. It doesn't. It's just a choice of what you use, unless it's PHP. <laughs> um, and I think that the, the conclusion that we're going to come to is that the future of Python web frameworks is rarely us working together. There's things that Django does really well, and there's things that Twisted does really well. And if you're all in one one camp and you refuse to take anything from the other, well, you're not going to get very far. So yeah, Django is good, Twist is good, just gonna say that up front. Everything I say is about how uh, Django sucks is because I want, I want Django to improve. I want Django to be as good as Twisted in the things that Twisted does, and I want Twisted to be as good as Django in what Django does. The easiest way is to just smash them together. So, First, I'll give an intro to Twisted for those that haven't done it, so you sort of know where I'm coming from. Uh, how many people have heard of Twisted? Okay, how many of you uh, use Twisted? Yay! Um, how many of you hate Twisted? <laughs> uh, thanks, Russell, that's, that's great. Um, so, Twisted is an asynchronous networking framework. It's very stable, it's very mature, it's like a decade old. 
Um, I was still in like year two when it first started, so which is hilarious. Um, it has a lot of primitives for different things you want to do with I/O, like HTTP, SSH, SMTP. Um, there's like some GPS stuff in there. There's IRC, MSN, if you want to use the service that's closed down. Um, it works on Python 2.7. We're porting stuff to Python 3.3 plus. We're at about 40%. You can do a lot of things. You can't, can't, also can't do a lot of things, but we're getting there. So here's an example of Flask. So something that many of you has pr have probably used. It's very short and to the point. Um, so that's synchronous code. This is the same example in Twisted. So as you can see, apart from some minor differences, or well, some minor and major differences, they more or less work the same. You don't have to deal with callback hell. There's um, things called inline callbacks now, which makes it work sort of a bit more like G-Event, where you yield from things. It's just a more or less a preference to, to what you want to use. But uh, let's you know go, go through it a bit. So Trek is um, a version of well, it's a requests clone, because requests is great, um, but it uses Twisted and Twisted's agents, uh, web agents uh, underneath. So when you do trek.get, it returns a deferred, which will fire at some later time. We then add a callback, and then we want to say we want to run trek.content uh, after the, it's actually got the page. And then we return it, and then it goes back into the web framework, and the web framework waits uh, for it to for it to fire. Uh, a client is also, I should mention, a clone of Flask. We're cloning everything. It's great, stealing all all the great stuff. Um, so the core of it really is deferreds. This is what may, this is sort of Twisted's semi-unique thing, and thing that a lot of people have trouble with. All they are is just an object which holds a result at some point in time. Callbacks are, you say, when this has that result, do this. So you sort of, you chain them together so ahead of time, so you chain them together and say, okay, get the page, do this to the page, and when it's fired, do this. So the example of the callback chain for something like a Twitter clone would be, you know, getting the request, getting the user account, check the permissions, get the profile, render the page, and return to the client. So you would have one deferred, and then you would put all of those as callbacks, the functions that do those different things. Um, so all, all they are is just makes, uh, makes it easier to write a, um, IO, uh, asynchronous IO using applications. But what really is asynchronous IO? I mean, not everyone has you know, delved into this, so I'll give you an explanation. So synchronous I.O., like Django, Flask, uh, a lot of all those things, is when functions that do I.O. return with the result. So they wait until the result has been got, and then they do a normal return. So if you do request.get, when request.get returns, you have the full page, essentially. A synchronous I.O. is when instead it returns immediately, and it gives a promise, or a deferred, or some sort of um, construct that lets you attach callbacks for when it happens. Yeah, Twisted used deferreds, but there's um, also uh, jQuery deferreds and promises in JavaScript, if you've ever used those. Similar sort of thing, sort of trying to put a uh, nicer interface on callbacks. There's a couple of benefits to this. Um, if you don't need the result, you don't really have to wait for it, so you don't have to put a blocking operation in the middle. So if you're incre incrementing a page count, uh, counter, you don't really care about the result. So you can tell it to go off and do stuff, and you don't have to wait for it to finish. Uh, because of the design of many asynchronous frameworks, handling many concurrent quiet connections, like WebSockets, it's basically a no-op. You don't have to really do anything other than hold the socket open. And it's because you are forced to break it up over the I.O. barriers uh, to make your callback chain, you end up with more pure functions that just take a result and uh, take an input and return a result. So it ends up being easier to test because it's already all broken up for you. Uh, Twisted uses the reactor model, uh, which is basically a, a single loop, and then everything works cooperatively. 
So uh, the reactor goes, hey, I've got some work for you to do, calls the callback, does some stuff. When it's finished, it hands back control and it keeps looping. It's very efficient for low CPU and high IO use cases like web frameworks generally because a lot of the time you're waiting for the database, you're waiting for MySQL to not be slow, you're waiting for Mongo to destroy your data, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, and things like DNS and that where basically you just are opening a connection and returning a result. You don't really do a lot of CPU. Uh, but to sort of do an analogy, let's talk about cooking because that's something I'm totally qualified to talk about. So the Y chef knows she can only do one thing at once. You, you can't do you know, the eggs and do something on the other side, of, other side of the room. But some of these things take time. So she puts the water on, puts it to boil, sets a timer, and while it's boiling, does something else, like collects some more ingredients. She puts eggs in once the water is boiled, sets a timer to wait for that. While the eggs are cooking, she does you know, oven stuff and chops the vegetables. And once the egg is ready, she, uh, she stops chopping the vegetables, takes it off the boil. The oven timer goes back, so she puts the vegetables in the oven for some reason. Um, and she serves the eggs while, <laughs> while the... <laughs> I'm very bad at cooking. I basically... <laughs> Um, she serves the eggs while the vegetables are cooking, and when the timer are off, she goes and serves the vegetables that were just shoved in the oven. So, delicious. But what really did that have to do with Tristan? Well, really, the chef is only one woman. So, but she did several things at once. The chef is more or less twisted, only capable of doing one thing at a time, really, but not everything needs her attention. Instead of having egg timers, you just have the reactor say um, something can be done, and then it notifies Twisted, and then it does the thing. So essentially, you have a queue of things to happen, and it just takes something off the queue, does it, and then keeps looping. Now, people sort of might want to get some of these benefits in Django. Unfortunately, Django is quite synchronous at its core. You can't really bolt it on it's very hard to do so after the fact. Generally, uh, people handle it by running it in a thread, uh, but when you're handling with the Python jill, you can't r run more than one Python, uh, section of Python code in a Python interpreter at once, so you end up having to have many processes. So to actually run multiple um, Django things that might all be waiting for database, you have to have many threads on many processes. The common sense is that asynchronous is hard. That's probably the reputation it's got. For another reason or another, it's you know, more or less there. But people think that synchronous code is easy just because it's, you return it, you get the result. In reality, everything has trade-offs. Synchronous is easier to understand. You have easier code flow. You only have one thread of execution. Other things can't happen while you're doing something. And there's a lot of software that uses it. So you can go and use requests, you can go and use Flask, everything works. But that only doing one thing at once, even, um, even if it's waiting for a database, does hurt a bit. It's very suited to the response request, uh, res request response cycle. It's not the other way around. So it's a natural fit for Django. Works really well. Um, but unfortunately, persistent connections like WebSockets are quite hard to implement. Asynchronous code, however, lets you have multiple threads of execution. Now, they're not running all at the same time because of the Python Jill, but they are queued. So, you, so while you're waiting for a database, other things can happen. Handling uh, evented connections is really easy. It's sort of almost there because um, Twist is event-driven. And the reactor model asynchronous that Twist uses is threadless. So you have one Python process with one thread, generally, unless you're using thread pools for things that are not synchronous. However, you have to be careful. You have to be a good citizen. If you do a synchronous call, for example, if you use, say, um, PyMongo or, or some, something that isn't made to be asynchronous, you will end up blocking the reactor and nothing will happen. Well, it, it'll happen, but you'll just be a massive performance bottleneck. And you have to be a bit more explicit about your I.O., which can be good. 
for, for some people, but it also is a bit harder. You have to think about it a bit more. You can't just go out to the database as easily. And in Python, you know, you have to have things that are specially written for it. You can't really get the upsides of both without, well, in Python anyway, you can't get the upsides in both. But you can try. There's a thing called Hendrix, which is a twisted Django, so that's a reference to Jimi Hendrix and uh, Django Reinhardt, so I don't know either of them, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm 21, so it's, <laughs> um, it's a whiskey server, uh, it's built on top of twisted, and it has uh, native web sockets. So it runs twisted, uh, you, it runs twisted, puts Django on top, runs in a thread pool, and allows Django to talk to Hendrix to do web sockets. So there's, there's the link. Uh, the, all these slides will be up on the web later, so you can actually click it. There's also Crochet, which uh, lets you run twisted code side by side with regular synchronous code. It makes a new thread, Twisted runs in the thread, and then you call into that thread to do things in Twisted. So it sort of bolts Twisted on. It works all right, but it does have some downsides. But there is a new project called Django Channels. It is the brainchild of Andrew Godwin, who wrote 1.7's migrations, which everyone loves, I, th I think. Um, I haven't used them. Um, they look pretty cool, though. I, I might steal them later. Um, so Django Channels makes Django event-driven. You have a asynchronous server, so uh, Twisted is one of the things it can run on, and synchronous workers. So essentially, Twisted is just the chef, head chef putting orders on the board, and then you have lots of other chefs, smaller chefs, all doing it like Oompa Loompas or something. Requests, regular requests, and WebSocket events are now events sent through channels, sort of messaging channels. Your handlers for these events are all, uh, are all synchronous. So you can use your regular Django code, you can use your regular requests, you can do whatever you like. Channel events go on a queue as they come in and are picked up by the workers, the synchronous workers, which are all running Django. Workers can also put things on the queue, but they can't get a result because, it's a, because the queue is asynchronous, it can't wait for it. So it does allow you to use WebSockets, which is pretty cool. If you don't care about the response, for example, the page count counter thing, you can, just, uh, you can just make a new channel, which is increment page counter. On the request, you can send a new event to a channel, and then that can handle it, and it doesn't block your current one. So that means that if you're doing a lot of things that you don't care about the response, like, for example, some metrics or um, yeah, tracking like that, then it will make your page loads much faster because it doesn't have to wait to do that in the database before it can actually return the useful result. The workers also uh, can run over the network, I'm pretty sure, because uh, one of the backends is a Redis queue or a Postgres queue or an in-memory queue. So they don't have to be on the same machine. So you have a multi-machine story right there. So you can have one one machine which handles all the connections, and you can have lots of worker machines that don't that aren't um, aren't connect actually connected to the net. Or they could be, but they're not the ones handling the requests. They just take things off the event queue and work on it. Doesn't matter whether it's web sockets. Doesn't matter whether it's a request. It just takes it off the queue. It doesn't care. However you might want to run multiple things at once. For example, if you're doing some uh, concurrent, uh, concurrent things that you want to speed up, you can't do that. This doesn't solve that problem. Your, syn uh, your synchronous workers are still synchronous. You can only do the one thing at a time, just like you do in Django right now. And your code is a few steps up from the actual WebSocket connection, so it'll be a bit slower. It, you won't be able to shove a lot of stuff down it. However, it will let you do it, and it will work for most purposes. If you, if you end up wanting, say, high-performance WebSockets, then this probably isn't the best bet. Writing something in Twisted or other similar frameworks is probably your best bet for there. But if you really need to shove that much performance, then you've, um, you probably can invest the time to you know, get all that, that all working smoothly. So what does it look like for you, the coder? Because if you want to use this, this is sort of what it looks like. This is one of the uh, examples in the documentation, which is a chat client that works over WebSockets, uh, plus an example request. So when the request comes in, WebSocket or HTTP, 
it sends the message to the channel. You then implement consumers. So you say that this function takes things off this queue. You are given a channel to send the results of the consumer when it's called. So in this one, you'll see uh, it, you were passed a response channel, if you can read that, um, which is where you write back the result. This also means that you can write back the result and then keep doing things. So you can return the page and then you can do other synchronous things afterwards. So it sort of decouples it from the request response cycle. Um, but in the case of a just a normal web request, you send back a channel encoded response object, which sort of makes it into JSON, so it'll fit in Redis, and so um, so it'll work a bit better. There's there's nothing really special as far as the messaging queue goes. It's just a regular um, Redis queue or Postgres or, or it, sorry, it uses the ORM. You can have an ORM-based backed one for testing, which would be pretty slow, but you know it, it'll work for your. Uh, for your testing purposes, and you can move to a real queuing uh, system afterwards. In case of WebSockets, you send back the content. So that uh, that there is, sorry, I'll just, uh, can I actually go back? Yeah. Okay, so as you can see there, the consumer is, okay, I'm, keynote, come on. Um, so, you can see there, you can see there that the consumer, you are consuming from Django.wizgy.request. So, that is essentially the lowest level you can go. That is before things like views happen, that is just the most basic. You can work on ones uh, uh, up a bit more, so I believe you can do like function-based views and class-based views and things like that with this, uh, but this is just, just an example in the documentation. So that's you know, you can do your own um, in here, you can, just like in regular Django, you can write your own routing code if you were that masochistic. So, Gen use Django, so it's, it's, don't roll your own. Don't. Um, <laughs> da, da, da. Cool. And then it goes back to the client. So, the worker machine doesn't actually have a connection to the real client. The one that puts everything on the queue is the one that actually does that. Oh. What? Oh, okay. Um, so that means that you can do some interesting things as far as networking goes, because you no longer have to have all these machines open to the internet and, uh, and put your HA proxy or whatever in front of it. You just have these router machines and then the worker machines, and they can scale independently. So if you um, aren't putting things on the queue fast enough, you add more routing machines. If you aren't handling the requests fast enough, you add more work machines. So it sort of makes it a bit easier for scaling Django as well, uh, which, which can be very, very handy because I believe, I, I haven't actually deployed Django much large scale, but I believe the uh, thing to do is just add more servers that have a full web server on them. So with this, each, each of those workers is much lighter weight. The WebSocket clients can be put into groups. So that means that you can broadcast messages out to them. So in the, um, uh, the chat group thing, you can, uh, you can do that so that when a message comes in, it sends that message to all of those in a group. So that means that you can put people in a group that are, say, if you've got a website with a WebSocket connection, that they're looking at a particular page. Then when you can do an ORM trigger, I, th I think that's what they're called, ORM triggers, on save triggers, yeah, on, on save triggers that when the thing that they're looking at changes, everyone that looks at that page can be put in a group and then message to say that it's updated. So it does allow you to make, uh, to handle things a bit better as far as push things go, thing goes, rather than doing Ajax requests and polling. So what makes it different to those other solutions like Hendrix and Carochet? Well, it doesn't make your, any of your code asynchronous. It just run, uh, runs async runners for your synch synchronous code. It doesn't really tackle the hard problem of actually running Django itself asynchronously. The ORM is still synchronous, all of that. That's, that doesn't change. So it doesn't get all of the benefits. Uh, it doesn't get all of the benefits as if it did. 
but that might be enough. I mean, you don't have to go, uh, you don't have to go fully in one direction. This might be good enough for your purposes. I mean, that's, I, th I believe that's the whole point of Django. You could write everything from scratch and it will be exactly to your purposes. But Django is there and it does all these things for you mostly correctly. So this will be one more thing which will do things mostly correctly for you. I think it's a very positive development for Django and I do hope that it gets into the main line pretty soon, or uh, when it's ready. It supports Python 2.7 and 3.3. Uh, we do, we have a newer Twisted because of the WebSocket support. It uses the Autobahn library, uh, which is more or less the standard Twisted uh, WebSocket library. And uh, this URL is where you can check it out, the documentation. Um, it's, it, it's uh, I think it's channels.readthedocs.org, I think, as well. Um, the, there's also Django-channels, which is an entirely different project. The other thing I want to talk about, composition. Russell knows, Russell is laughing because I drone on about this. I'm doing a full talk on this tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. called Slow Down, Compose Yourself, How Composition Can Help You Write Modular Testable Code. Um, so I won't go into it too much here, but I'll give you some things that, you know, if you're interested in it, you can go, go forward and, you know, investigate it. So Django relies on inheritance to customize behavior. You take a view and you subclass it and you override stuff. There's a lot of Django code where it ends up as a maze of mix-ins and super calls. Now this can get very confusing. Composition is when larger blocks of logic are made up by smaller ones. So rather than subclassing, you just have something that meets some interface and then you pass it in and tell it instead of doing uh, that on the subclass, do it on this object instead. So you can have a database object. Uh, I think one of, uh, a good example of this is ADB API, I think, uh, no, sorry, DB API, which is the standard one. That is so, sort of composition-based design. All of these different databases have standard, uh, standard ways of calling them. So it doesn't matter, uh, well it sort of does, but it, in the most basic terms, it doesn't matter what one it is because they all meet that interface and they all work very similarly. So a database driver, for example, you can move the ORM one layer deeper. So that means that when you're testing, you don't actually do ORM calls because you refactor it so that what would usually do an ORM call in line, it does the ORM call and calls a function with the result of that. So then when you go to test, all you need to test is that function. You don't need to set up a new database, you don't need to fill it full of fake data because you can just call the function as a regular thing in a unit test. It can make it so much faster and when you combine it with um, integration tests which actually talk to the ORM, you can get very, very reliable software. A new generic view system on top of Django channels it isn't there. I think that this could be a really great opportunity to bring something new into Django that sort of fits in with all of this. I do hope to um, sort of, ha I've been meaning to do a generic uh, composition-based views, but I just haven't had the time. Um, too many yaks to shave. Unit testing. Now, this was a slide which was stand-in, but this sort of sums it up. I don't like the ORM and how it makes nearly all Django code untestable. Database dumps get outdated. In the development stages of your application, you don't know exactly what schema you need, then it becomes a very common where your test data is not what your database actually takes. So if your test data is, say, very relational, then you end up having to write scripts or something to actually replicate it, and then turn it into SQL, or you know, put it in the database and then dump it out, and it's, you know, if you compose the ORM touching sections, like I mentioned, then it can be way easier to test because all you do is call functions. You have your integration test, which has the test database, but you don't need it to know that the basic logic works. So you don't need to pull up a whole database just to test that, say, this number is bigger than this number and this logic is correct. Please don't write to the database in your unit tests. Integration tests, uh, there's sort of like unit tests are testing the logic of your code. Integration tests make sure that the whole code works. You rarely need unit tests. Unit tests are great. They make it really easy to test things which might otherwise be hard. 
for example, if you have something that potentially violates consistency of the database and you really, really need to make sure that that doesn't happen, then it makes it easier because you don't have to wrangle Postgres into accepting something which is against the schema. You can just give it the value. Don't have any external databases in your tests. If you have something like React or Mongo or any of those databases which you might have side by side, don't spin them up in your tests. It makes it really hard to run them. And it also makes it slower because you don't have all of the nice things that Django does to set up your database because Django does that very well. It wipes it out, it loads in your schemas, it does all that very well. Unless you have special code that does this really reliably, this will end up being nothing but headaches. And you should instead make stand-ins. You don't need to actually write to MongoDB when uh, putting it in an in-memory, say, list or dictionary can work just as well. Then make assertions on what it actually called, what query arguments it gave then you can make sure that your code is actually passing in what seems sane. You should re use those real databases for integration and acceptance tests though. But those should really be driven by something like Selenium under unit test or something like that. Um, the things that you actually run when you go um, uh, set up to PyTest test or whatever you have or nose or whatever, those should be unit tests. Integration tests should be the whole kit and caboodle, caboodle. I don't know. Um, if you have both, you have very dependable code. You have very reliable code. You know that it works at every single layer. You know that not only is the logic solid, but you know that it all fits together well. Now, Django is a big ball of mutable, mutable global state. Many parts, oh, that was, yeah. Django is a yeah, big ball of mutable global state. There's things that would re be really good to use outside of Django, but the configuration of that makes it really hard. You can't have a form in one section that has a different configuration than another without some really horrible monkey patching or other disasters. I like Django Forms. Django Forms is my favorite part of Django. It makes everything so easy and is a pleasure to use. It, it is really one of the things that even though I don't use Django anymore, I come back and use that. I don't care if I have to monkey patch it, it is worth it. So I would like Django to un unravel all of that global state and make it so that you can use it in other things. You can use it in Flask because Django, uh, bits of Django have much more use than just inside Django because it's really good. It's great. I love you all for having it. So really, why not just use Twisted? Well, Twisted has its place. Django has its place. Django is very opinionated. Well, in some ways, in the ways that Twisted isn't. It saves you a lot of time. It has a lot of things in it that save you time, that get you a blog, get you a website, get you all this stuff without having to do a lot of work. In an example I did, I did a testing of, um, of a small, uh, for example, the Django Girls tutorial. It's not a lot of code, which is really good because when you've got people that don't have any idea about code to start with, you don't p uh, pile heaps of code on them. It's like you want a list of items, inherent list view. You get it, it all works. Twisted is more like a pile of bricks. You can build things with it, it takes some time, but it'll be solid. And Django has good opinions about a lot of things. So we should keep those opinions. There should be a, a framework which isn't scared to say, this is how you do things. This is the recommended way to do things. This is how you do migrations. This is how you do, say, forms. It's really good to have something that just does it for you. And it's something that I wish Twisted did more, but really they have their place and I think that the future is projects like Hendrix, which is a runner on top of Twisted, and Django Channels, because then it, it rarely lets you get the best of both worlds. Hendrix will let you do Twisted things if you have uh, more protocols you want to use, but if you want Django, your Django to just be a bit faster, just be able to use WebSockets, Django Channels is excellent. It will do exactly what you want, and it will do it well. The other thing is that Twisted isn't really hard, it just 
brings you a couple layers down, makes you deal with hard concepts like asynchronous I.O. In no language is it easy. Uh, there's things that make it nicer in other languages, but is it no means absolutely easy. You need to r assess the trade-offs. Django does things good, Twisted does things good. It's no point going, Django is great, I hate Twisted, blah, 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 blah. If you're doing something like a DNS server that you need, a, uh, for example, if you have a website where you have um, dynamic URLs, you can write a Twisted DNS server in like 10 minutes that will do exactly that. It will load it from a database, return the thing. It's all there, it's a toolkit for you to do it. So there's no point just avoiding it because you don't like how its web framework works. There are many portions of it. Django is really good at getting you a CMS, getting you a, a site that's like a blog, getting you a newspaper, which is what it was originally designed for. It's really good at that. You need to pick and choose. You need to decide what parts of your project are more Django-oriented or Flask-oriented or things like that, and choose the best tool for the job. If I ever want to write a blog, I will write it in Django. I don't care if it's not asynchronous. I don't care if I complain about how the ORM is very confusing for me. It does it well, and it lets me do it in like five minutes, and I can worry about the real things, like having the perfect shade of black on white monotype text. <laughs> it's very important. The future is working together. I, th I think that there's, there's been some friendly rivalry. I'll say friendly in, in, sometimes friendly, sometimes not. I think that there does need to be a bit more communication. There does need to be some people that know both and work with both and know when things should go from one to the other. And there needs to be more people that think, hey, Django might be really good for this or hey, Twisted might be really good for this. You can give it a shot. I mean. You know, the best thing about software is it's very squishy. It doesn't matter if your first thing doesn't work. You can always try something else. So in short, next time you need WebSockets, experiment with Django channels. Next time you run your view, try and write your logic to take data rather than calling the ORM directly. Investigate composition. I'll be doing a talk on it tomorrow. Um, if you're not going to Russell's talk, then you should come to mine, or the other talk. I don't know, choose what you want. Be a free person. <laughs> and most of all, don't be scared of Twisted. It's not that scary. It's just code. One last thing. Django Girls Australia is happening on Monday the 3rd of August. Um, there are still places for people that want to be mentors or people that want to be students. So come along. I'll be dragging several people into it. Um, like, Russ, have you signed up to be a mentor? If not, I'm dragging you along. Ah, uh, okay, so we'll need someone like Russ, who isn't Russ because he's doing other things. We'll need Russ 2.0. So there's still, still time to apply, still time to let people know that are in Brisbane that it's the thing. It's going to be fun. There will be cupcakes, I'm sure. I'll get some cupcakes. That's what makes you happy. Questions? Please ask questions. Don't tell me how I'm wrong. Do that after. I'm, you can tell me how I'm wrong afterwards. <laughs> cool. Oh no, Russell's got the first question. Help. Well, of course there is. Of course I've got the Help first me. question. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Amber, for that. Uh, if anybody does have any questions, uh, please form an orderly rabble behind me. And just as a general reminder about questions when they come to conferences, the word, uh, when you have a question, it does not start with the word, I have a comment. Uh, questions begin with words like, can you tell me about, or do you have an opinion on? So please keep the comments. If you want to have a comment, submit a talk, and you can talk at conferences. And I'll be here like the whole weekend, yes. so you can yell at me Share if I'm then. wrong. Um, so yeah, just to get the, the ball rolling, um, you've talked about asynchronous and synchronous and, yep. and what the stacks look like in terms of software. The bit you sort of haven't spoken about is what it looks like in production. Uh, you know, the, the, the synchronous web story Django people are familiar with, you stick it behind mod whiskey, mm -hmm. you put that behind Nginx, some sort of load balancer, or you use Gunnercorn and, and a load balancer. Yep. What does the production story look like with Twisted in, in that mix? Okay, so Twisted has, uh, from projects like Hendrix, that uses Twisted's Whiskey Runner because Twisted has a production-ready web server. It mostly works with PyPy and it works very well on CPython. And so generally, when you're deploying a Twisted using application, you use the, Twist D, uh, the tw Twisted daemon application and make a plugin and then just basically go Twisted 
your project and then it starts it up. Um, so people, uh, there are integrations, for example, SystemD, for those that use it. Um, it can work with socket activation, all, all that sort of thing, so you can restart it without uh, losing any connections. But essentially, you don't put Nginx in front of it. You can put something like HAProxy or something like that, uh, something similar, a uh, load balancer to sort of make it a bit easier, but rarely it's just running twisted. It's got its own web server. It's pretty good. Um, it's a bit rough around the edges when you're writing software, but it's still pretty good. All right, thank yep. you. Hi, thank you for the talk. I was wondering if you uh, have any opinion or if you looked at the other asynchronous solutions for Python, like Eventlet or or Gevent, and how do they compare to Twisted? And right. Um, okay, so Gevent and Eventlet, I think all of those use Greenlets, which are essentially mini threads. Now, there's a really good blog. Uh, I'm, I haven't really used those in depth, just because I sort of drank the Twisted Kool-Aid like it was going out of style. But if you go on Glyph's blog, so Glyph. I think blog. .glyph .im, um, Glyph is the founder of the Twisted Project. He's really cool. Um, I believe he did a similar talk at DjangoCon US a couple of years ago. Yeah, uh, yeah, he was doing something else, but he's he's got bits of twist in everything he does. He actually did a blog post about this, so I'd recommend doing that. Um, I believe it comes down to it doesn't work as well as the cooperative multitasking does as far as reasoning about your code, but it does the, essentially the same thing at the end of the day. So it's... Um, I think Gevent also works on Python 3 now, so there's no longer the Twisted is the only one that works on Python 3. AsyncIO does not exist. I am ignoring it. So um, AsyncIO is pretty good as well. It's it's essentially um, a Twisted instant library. It takes a lot of a lot of the um, ideas of Twisted, and Glyph was actually a part of the pep process, I believe. So yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. I have a follow-on question from uh, for, from Russell's about production deployment. The situation for doing web application performance monitoring for synchronous apps on Whiskey is sort of getting fairly well developed along, mm -hmm. but in the async world, it's much much harder. Um, in the in the async, in the synchronous world, you can rely on the fact you've got a thread local and you can use that uh, to collect information across the, the lifetime of a request. Mm -hmm. uh, in an async world, it's not quite the same because at each point you might want to put monitoring in, there's no easy spot to put things because everything's happening in the same freak. Are there any solutions in the Twisted world for web application performance monitoring or can you see any ways Twisted could be changed to put hooks in or something like that to assist? So essentially, rather than using a thread local, um, the solution for that, for example, uh, the Elliot logger, which has the sort of which you would do a thread local logger to keep the context. Uh, what you do is you just pass it on the callback chain. So you just have an object, which is your monitoring object, and you just pass it down the callback chain. That's not as friendly. Um, you can walk up the stack and do some magic. Uh, there are a couple things. I wrote something called Eagle Eye, which sort of acts as a wrapper around uh, deferred, so that it does that sort of monitoring. But the problem is that when you're monitoring asynchronous code, it's no longer this took this long to do, because it might be broken up in several several portions. So there is that problem. Um, I'm not sure there's any real easy ways to do it, like profiling doesn't work, but there are new projects called, uh, there's a new project called VMProf, which works with PyPy, which is a much better, much better profiler, and the Twisted and PyPy communities are pretty meshed, so we're going to be looking into making that really easy to use, but that's a bit after the fact. Um, as far as monitoring, no, there's no real easy way apart from, you know, passing it in rather than using a thread local and then, um, whoop, Never mind. Uh, doing all of that because there's two things you want to know: how long did this code take to run, and how long did this request take to get back to the user? And it rarely cares about what you care about because in Django they're one and the same, but in Twisted they're not um, because something that's waiting for a database for uh, t five seconds and then has to wait for another thing that's doing a lot of CPU will be longer. So. Essentially, you need to figure out what you want to monitor, and that will change how you monitor it. Because if you're simply doing how long does the request take, you just, uh, before, the, uh, before the deferred, you just go get the current time, do the deferred, add a callback to the end, and add a timer there, and then just subtract it, and you can get that. And that'll tell you the wall clock time. Um, 
But as far as internal, uh, as far as running code, I think the future will be VMProf. Um, we, I, I, I work for uh, Tevendo, I'm working on the Crossbar IO asynchronous WebSocket router, and we're experimenting with that as well because we use uh, Twisted quite heavily and we're trying to figure out where all our CPU bottlenecks are. So uh, we have to sort of uh, keep on with that and solve that sort of problem. So in short, no real solution yet. That you can do, you can fix it, but there's nothing that you just sort of chuck on. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have a question? Okay, then in that case, thank you very much, Amber, for that. <laughs>